which will be nice. Yeah. This week's favorite is supposed to be to the 40s. Yeah, this week too. Yeah, I this week, yeah. yeah. 40s, 50s. Uh, I don't think I'll we'll go 40s this week. week. Next week we might get We have a lot of meetings on holidays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least it's not Christmas. Yes. <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And Dr. Murray asked to give you his key. Now, how did I, he reach out to you? Or? No, I called him today. Okay. To tell him I had a key for him. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we just talked about it this afternoon. I yeah. Said I would take responsibility. But you did. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And I saw Mr. Schmidt at the post office the other day. And this is Carl. So Carl's coming today. So the old keys are recyclable. Actually, I don't know. Looks nice, doesn't it? Yeah. I would say I probably know what about spirit keys go through. I like, I need a good No, I was not feeling like I got it. This is our camp. I'm not sure. I think I'm going to go to the camp. I'm not sure. 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 Soccer. Oh, yes. I'm a little scooter. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like. Did you see that email I sent out with the sound system? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that works really, really well for me. So where did you do it? I've been doing it at, at uh, we do a dinner theater a couple times a year over in Canada, Soda. Uh -huh. And what I do, what, what I use is over-the-ear mic, so the, the actors actually have the mic right on their faces. Mm -hmm. And I do it wirelessly, and then I use the, the restaurant sound system and the two speakers to basically reinforce the sound for the audience. But in, in a room like this, the two speakers are more than enough. So. Where, and likely, where would the speakers be? The, the best place for it was right in the back corners. Like mounted up on the. Yeah, I just mounted up high. Or yeah, I, I would put them up high either you know to make a shelf or, or something like that to, to set them on. They come with tripods too, so. I don't know if Pete Jr. is coming tonight or not. I sent him an email to see if he was, but he'll turn back. Why something canceled? He, he sent it out to the planning board and then to the Larry for the calendar. So.
Is that a gummy bear? It kind of looks like it. I can't see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to yeah, really touch it. it. I think it is. What? It's not going to walk by itself. I didn't know if it was going to be one of those things. I got out the fish of snowshoeing for a change. Still can be. Down no skiing for a change. Yeah. With decent snow. No. no. <laughs> Did everyone get a chance to read over the minutes from last week's me meeting? Any questions, corrections? No, I thought they looked good. Okay. Can I have a motion to accept? I'll make that motion to accept the minutes. And a second? I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Um, under old business tonight um, just an ABA update uh, Carl do you want to uh, yeah I well I sent I sent you out a, uh, a setup which is very very similar to what I use for the theaters that I that I helped produce uh, and basically you would have microphones sitting on the table um, and then the, they were they're wirelessly connected back into a powered speaker system and that would add the reinforced sound into the room so you can turn it up as loud as you, you know, as, you, as you find you need it. And the secondary thing is you can you can even record off of it if that way that's what you decide you want to do. Okay. And the thing is completely portable. You don't have to fasten it to a wall or table or anything else. Everything is fully removable. So when you're done, you can take this up down and lock it away. Now you mentioned something about batteries. Yeah, the the little power packs do require batteries. Um, I just power them with, with the regular alkaline AA cells. And as a rule, I get about anywhere from four to five hours of working time on a set of batteries once, once the packs are turned on. So depending on how many, how many times things are used a month, you might have to replace the batteries once or twice. But I, I buy them on Harbor Freight. You know, they're seven bucks for two dozen batteries, so. Right. Now the ones that the thing that you priced out, how many microphones was that for? The, or, or? the set comes with eight microphones. Oh, okay. You have eight eight lapel style microphones, which is what I would put on your little microphone stands that I showed you. Yep. And it also comes with, with eight little headsets that you can actually put on and have the mic right in front of you too. Okay. Now, uh, and, and either one will work. No, uh, when someone's speaking to the near the back of the room, like John Ether, Tug Hill guy mm -hmm. he's in the back of the room and he's speaking will will that work it, it won't work with that you'd have to you have to be within you know say three or four feet of the mics to get picked up and amplified uh, i do use an auxiliary setup uh, that has a couple of just hand mics uh, and you could add that to the system so that if somebody wants to speak and you want to put them on the microphone you just hand them one and you just tie the same thing into the other system well, if you have eight with that setup, we could always hand them one. Yeah. To John or yeah, you can you can have you can have the little portable packs with with a lapel mic, and they can just you just hand it to them, and they can talk right into it and be heard. Because the with the sensitivity of those microphones, would you really need to have that like in a setup like this? Would you need more than one per table, or should each? Um, the, they're going to read those particular systems are actually set up to have it within about a foot or so of oh, a person. Okay. You can easily crank up the sensitivity. I'm, I'm in, I've had them up so that I can pick up somebody eight or nine feet away, but you probably want one in front of each, each person. position just to, okay. be, just to be sure. Now you said you can also record. Um, you can take the output from the you know, from the receiver, yeah. and that normally goes into the amplified speakers. Yeah. Uh, and you can tap off those speakers and record off of that too. So you can have an audio recording of it. 
So you'd have to have a device to record. You'd have to have a separate okay. audio. It's not going to. It doesn't have backup on it. It doesn't. It doesn't okay. have the, the recorder built into it. Okay. Did the emails have the cost or yes. what? Yes. No. Yes, I, I think it was about seven hundred fifty bucks for the whole setup. Right. Okay. Purchasing it online. Yeah. I, I mean, I just bought my setup off of Amazon. It was the fastest, cheapest way to go. Okay. I don't. I don't know if you have an upper limit where you need two, you know, two sets of cost proposals on it. Well, I, I checked that, and um, only if it's over a thousand dollars, you have to get a couple quotes. Yeah. So you wouldn't need anything else. Uh, if you're buying off of Amazon, that's probably the cheapest. You wouldn't be able to buy it in the store around here. No. No. Okay. So do we want further discussion? Here? Should we go ahead and order? Make motion. Well, it sounds like a good system if you've used it before. Right. If uh, I'll tell you what, if you want, um, if if you want to wait and see how well they work, I can bring my system down and set it up for you. The only thing I don't have is clips for the table, but I can bring it down and set up mics for you so you can see how it works and get a get a feel for it. If you want to wait, why don't we try that? I'll, I'll bring yeah. it down and demo for you. Yeah, that would be great. Demo yeah. for you. Yeah, that would be one of the places instead of a hand. I don't know. This is just money saving. I, I was just curious that if there is there any type of grant that since it's like a disability type of thing? Don't know. Just yeah. curious if the county might help. There might be a grant, but chances are it would take much longer to process a yeah, grant than that, to yeah. purchase yeah. it. Usually grants are six months out or better for that. Make a suggestion also of uh, all the um, gosh, I just lost the name of it. It's the organization at six six seventy Catherine Street Trade Triad. Yeah, yeah. Technical rehabilitative adaptive equipment. Sometimes they get equipment donated, so they might have something okay. like that, and we could use it as a test to see. Two nine two. I have their okay. information. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll, I'll bring mine down and, and yeah. you can yeah. see, see what it looks like and see how it works. Thank you, Carl. Okay, any yeah, other you. questions for Carl? Mm -hmm. okay. Any other old business? No? Okay. Under new business, we're um, appointing um, Dr. Wilbert to the assessment review board to take the position that was left vacant on it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Pay raise. Pay raise. Okay. <laughs> Ask him. <laughs> All in favor? I actually do get that. Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's to fill the vacancy, <laughs> and that term expires <laughs> October 1st, yeah, so 2024. Normally, they're a five year term, so this fall we'll have to either reappoint or find someone else. What's that? Those gets done in the fall? Yeah. You mean I'm done in the fall? <laughs> you could be. At the end of October, the term would be okay. Um, that's all the new business I had tonight, so we can. Did you want me to let uh, Steve Hunter know that we filled the vacancy? Because I know he brought it up at the last meeting. Oh, yeah, if you want to, or sure. I can. Yeah, oh, thank you. You let me, if you want to do it? No, you're, you're fine. Oh. Go ahead. Thanks. So now we'll, what do I say exactly? Discussion of the uh, discussion. Going along. Okay, well, going into a work session for a discussion, further discussion on the zoning law. Before we do that, could I just do one thing to get it out of the way? Um, the gift from the town of Western Civic Affairs is not going to come till summer, I know, but I, I just want to get it out of the way because before I lose it, it's just a brand new pickleball racket set. Oh, thank I you. didn't know if we could put this at the library. I know kids there maybe. There used to be a, a youth program. Um, that is generally where everything is. Well, if it, so you have to talk to the whoever's in charge of the library? Well, right now there's an issue with the insurance that the library has that they're not supposed to loan out any recreational equipment. 
So no. they're searching for new policies and stuff like that. Okay. But if you're going to donate it, then you know, yeah, I mean, what, what happens happens. But yeah, it's just something I thought yeah. would be nice for people that haven't tried pickleball, which. Thank you. I have. Are you a pickleball player? <laughs> I'm not a pickleball. Looks <laughs> 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 like exercise. Larry, I got a question with that. This really thing. Because um, Rome Library, they let out all kinds of things there. Mm -hmm. uh, they're recreational. They probably have insurance for it. Now. So is there, is between different libraries, is there different insurance covers? Is that a town thing or is it a library? It's a library. It's a library. It's a library. It's a library. So why wouldn't all the libraries under that system have the same? Well, research? each library has their own policy. So uh, the library is researching with other companies to try to get that coverage back. They had it before. But if all the libraries are under the same system, why wouldn't they have the same insurance? Yeah, they, each library has their own insurance. They're each independent of each other. Right. The libraries. So, on to the zoning. I don't know where we want to start. I kind of forgot where we left off. Mm -hmm. It was a good, we kind of went through a lot of it, and then we also went through the definition. We kind of bounced around a little bit. Yeah. 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 Did you talk about the commercial overlay? Not in much detail. No, not the depression. Um, I'm sorry. So we could start with, with maybe uh, give me an idea okay. of, of what yeah, the the overlay system that you can use in zoning laws and it's it's a recognized thing allows you to create uh, to create basically what turns out to be special uses that are not specifically defined within a particular zone. So you know similar to what with the fire department you created a you know a, a public service zone. And it's an overlay that sits on the RA district that it sits in right now. What it allows you to do is designate a specific area within a within a zone, and allow additional uses that are not normally permitted within that zone. So, in the case of the commercial overlay, which basically lies along 46, basically from Dop Hill Road up to uh, up to Northwestern or Dixon Road. Uh, or Dixon Road, rather, yeah, Dixon Road. Um, basically, you have a, 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 a band along 46, where even if, even if it's not within a particular zone, you can allow commercial uses within that zone. Requires action by the Zoning Board of Appeals to grant a, a special use permit. They can refer it to the Planning Board if they think, you know, the Planning Board ought to look at it and, and make some recommendations or whatever. By their it, choice, by your choice, or the ZBA's choice. Right, but ultimately, it ultimately now resides with the ZBA to approve or disapprove that particular use. Okay. The same thing happens across the North Shore of Lake Delta along the county route there. Mm -hmm. So those are the two places where we've designated that as an overlay. So if somebody wants to put a commercial use in, they have to come in and apply for that special use permit. There's a whole review process, stuff they have to bring in to show us that it's not going to alter the character of the neighborhood or make any major changes. Um, and and like, um, like a variance, the adjoining property owners would be notified. Right. Okay. Yeah, well, and, and you know, any special use permit requires a public hearing. So mm -hmm. we would automatically hold a public hearing. Everybody would be notified of that. They'd have a chance to you know, voice an opinion one way or the other. The difference is the standards for it are much less than a variance. Right now, to get a use variance, 
is about that far from impossible because the standards that are, that are dictated in the state law are Shit. extremely no, difficult. No, no, yeah. no. Well, the, the hardest one in there is to prove that you can't, what they call a reasonable return on the property. Not the business they want to put in, not the use they want to make of it, but the property itself can have no reasonable return without that use. All right. And so it, has, it has proven in a couple of court cases where variances that were granted were tossed out because you just can't prove it. It's almost impossible to prove it. Um, and there, there is one other overlay in there. Uh, if you look through the thing, we also have a planned development overlay that's restricted to residential uses. And what that permits you to do is go in and reduce the amount of area that's required for an individual residence when taken into consideration with a larger area. So it, it would be in use in conjunction with a subdivision. Clustering. Right. Right. Yeah, and clustering would be a typical use. Yeah. We've mm -hmm. talked about that like I think 35 years yeah. ago. And, and a lot of this has been <laughs> in the works for about that long. Just about that um, long. And yeah. this is really impressive and the volume of work that the boards did to arrive at this point. Thank you. It's, it's not easy. Um, having been on the planning board, I mean, everything gets turned over, discussed from every aspect before it gets to this point. And so I, I, I want to make it clear that I'm not going to be shooting from the hip. But I do have a couple of questions yeah. about things that, that uh, I've known a little bit about through the years. Um, uh, if I go to the map, one of them is, I, I think when the highway went through around Main Street, mm -hmm. I think uh, the DOT said no drives off the new highway. Yep. Um, and so uh, that's pretty much from the south end of Main Street to the north end of Main Street. Um, I, I know Woods Valley was not allowed to do that for a long, long time, and they recently were able to, and I, I believe it had something to do with a culvert that accessed farm, farmlands yeah, probably. at one time. So, well, he just had to get it designed and go in front of, he had it all engineered and go in front of a yeah, process with the state, and then they approved it. And access onto the state highways, uh, it's more of a building permit issue than it is a zoning issue. So, so, I mean, if somebody came on, let's say, on, on the backside of, of Westernville here up to 46, and they say, I want to put in a, in, and I want to go in that commercial overlay zone, and I want to put in a little ice cream stand. And they would have to come in front of us, and the first thing we would ask them is, do you have permission from the state to actually put access onto 46? If you don't walk in and say, I've already, you know, applied to the state, and they said they'll give me access, this, you know, then what's the point? Because you, you know, you so know, the process know. wouldn't begin with you, basically. If I if I was going to do the ice cream stand, if, if they wanted to put it in, the first the first person they go to is the codes officer, mm -hmm. and the codes officer would look at it from a zoning standpoint, and he would say, okay, that's in a commercial overlay district. He would then refer those refer those to them to the ZBA. They would come in in front of us. We would tell these are all the conditions that you have to be able to meet before we're going to grant you this permit. And one of them includes whether or not you're going to get 239M, which is the county and state approval, in order to do that. And so what Scott would do would take that, he would submit it as a 239M. They would come back and say, you know, okay, we'll approve that access to the highway. We won't approve the access to the highway. And that'll just kind of kill it right there. So it's a coordinated process. Mm -hmm. So we would look at it and make sure that there was something done on it before we would even consider making a ruling on it. If they came in and the state said, sure, you can have the driveway and, and uh, they could meet all of the other requirements, like you know, putting a septic system where they're going to get water from and stuff, we would look at that. We would look at what it's going to do within the Hamlet area because that's where that backs up to and say, okay, is this going to change the character of Westerville? And you know, unless they, you know, if they come in and show us architecturally, yeah, we're going to kind of match the older buildings and, and keep it in that same vein then we may ask planning board, what do you think? Do you have any recommendations? They would come back to us and ultimately we would then vote yay or nay as to whether they get the zoning permit. After that, they gotta come in with all the plans, all of the engineered, everything, and get it past the codes officer before they even get a building permit. 
Okay, we have two different permits now. There's a zoning permit that says, yes, you comply with zoning. And then there's a building permit that says, here's how you're gonna comply with, this, with the uniform building code, fire codes, and everything else. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've separated those two out. All right. Um, and, and another thing is the canal. The, you know, some places still intact, some places it's obliterated. But um, I do believe that the, uh, I don't know who has control. The Canal Corporation apparently doesn't yeah. have control any longer. I, I, I think State Parks and Recreation actually controls the right of way now. And I've even heard that it went from them to the New York Power Authority. <laughs> so, who knows. But, um, one of the things with the canal, uh, the North Country Trail system, you familiar with that at all? Yeah. 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 So that's been in the works, I think, they started the concept in like 1973. In 1980, they actually started the trail. The trail goes from North Dakota to, at least Vermont, maybe to Maine. 4,800 miles of trail. And a lot of it has been completed. And so uh, it goes along the Erie Canal <coughs> to Rome, and then Rome has a trail system now that goes all the way to the dam. Yep. And then it is going to go from the dam uh, eventually to Boonville. By that, they have completed some trails that, believe it or not, are, are up here in Clark Hill. Really? Yep. Hmm. They did that recently in the past year, <clears throat> and. Um, it's kind of vague how they're going to get from the canal up here, but the trail does go all the way down to Pixley Falls. Um, so this trail is going to go through the middle of Westernville, mm -hmm. the town of Western. Uh, when they have no other choice, they'll, they'll use the road, not favor yeah. at all. So if they could be on the canal, which is what they've done most of the way to get to the dam, um, that would be that would be the preference and so the canal is well probably some of it's inside the overlay yeah um and some of it's inside the lc um so i, I just uh i think that it's it's important to consider that with with this plan um uh it's, it's been discussed uh, well i think that that LC, it, it explains uh, this this corridor. It's, it's been um, evaluated by I think the Tug Hill Commission did one or something. Yeah. Scenic, uh, scenic area. And so, you know, uh, if you're on the highway looking that way, that's the, that's the scene. And if you had much development on that side of the highway, you're cutting down on this yeah. on the scenic valley. Right. I, I would see that as two issues. Number one would be, what is the zoning permit? What is the zoning allowed? Okay, and the second would be, really, it's a planning board issue. And one of the things we're going to take up this year is we're at the point where it's time for the five-year review of the existing comprehensive plan. And so, my my feeling on that is, knowing that the state is working on doing all of this, we would take that into account. In, in updating the comprehensive plan and acknowledging that that's going to exist. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised they yeah. haven't approached us. Uh, yeah, did, I, did I, 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I know the the actual trail itself goes up as far as, as uh, Wright Settlement Road. You can follow what's left of the old towpath in there. I would never do that on a bicycle again. I did it once. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I know it's going to come up as far as the fish hatchery. I haven't figured out exactly where they're going to end up with the dam, but I know they're, they're going along that side of the road. Well, it's the, the canal to the fish hatchery, and then it's also the canal. The canal is on the, uh, the west side of the river. Right. And so it's it's that, and the trail is, is done. I've walked it. Oh, it had, All it the way to the dam. Okay. Yeah, they, they've had that actually done for quite a while. Uh, they don't advertise much about it. Yeah, I haven't seen that part of it. Um, so is that, that the, federal line? What? Is that federal? Not state. Is that state by state? state. I'm not sure. They could go. Oh, the I trail. The trail the itself is National Park Service is sponsoring that. I think is the is the underlying agency or Department of the Interior one of yeah. those sponsoring the overall trail thing. But as far as our section, that's New York State. North Country Trail. They've got North a website. North Country Trail is the name. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So that and then uh, of course there's also a, a migra migration area. The north end yeah. connecting Tug Hill to the Adirondacks. 
I don't know exactly what they call the, the border on that, but um, that's, that's also a work in progress and uh, just good to be aware of. Yeah. And, and one of the things you see out there, you see the OS, that's yep. open space. Most of that is either the county or the state forest and the left of it, the rest of it, we've just left as agricultural land, which is primarily what it is. So. Mm -hmm. Good. We didn't make too many changes. What we did was combine the residential rural and the residential agricultural zones into one RRA zone. We eliminated the residential seasonal zone, which is over Mullen Hill, over Slide Hill. And everything else is pretty much where it was. The only thing we did was add the Standish, little Standish Street development into the RC zone because they are relatively dense housing. Right on, right on the corner there. Right yeah, there. right down there. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's all. On. Yeah. So that's Thank that's you. what those are. But yeah, um, and a lot of these things you should you know when you've got these kinds of so bring them up to the planning board too. That you know here are new things we know that are coming in, so we'll take notice of those things and start looking at the comprehensive plan and seeing what needs to be built in there, and what comes out of that, depending on how long it takes us to go through the whole thing. Hopefully not as long as getting it written. Um, will be to look then look again at the zoning law and see if we need to make any updates to it based on the new comprehensive plan. That's the, the way it's supposed to work is you update the plan, you look at your zoning, does zoning support the plan? If it doesn't, you revise the zoning law to support the plan. Thanks, one. Anything else, guys? A lot of this stuff in here has not changed significantly from the previous one. We did update, we added a lot more definitions. If you look through that section, you'll find probably five times as many definitions as in the old one because there were so many references in the law that didn't have a definition that when it comes in front of the ZBA, we were kind of hamstrung because we can't make something more restrictive than the law already is. Uh, so you have to be careful how you, how you define things. Uh, we did kind of expand and, and kind of enforce things like basically the, the the LC zones, which are basically the flood zones. And we've referenced the FEMA flood maps for the Mohawk Valley, or for the Mohawk River area. And then for the rest of them, I think we're 50 feet of either side of the, uh, the east branch of the river and the Lansing Kill where it comes through. And that's basically to protect those particular areas. Basically floodplain, huh? Right. I saw things like cell towers and solar farms and wind farms. So, so there's a, we, we did a lot of work on the uh, solar installations and not quite as much but a corresponding amount for things like, like wind power systems as well because they're both regulated by the, uh, with the state with the uh, ORES system which is, uh, it, it's basically the siting requirements where above a certain power production capability the state basically takes over the permit process. <clears throat> and we, what we've done in here is essentially adopt the uniform solar permitting code, which I think is also part of the, uh, part of the law you guys passed that enabled the, uh, the existing building codes as well. That, that was the enforcement capability you gave to Scott. Um, right to farm, is there anything? Uh, what we discovered, especially with talking with Tug Hill, is state ag law can basically override anything in here where it's an ag, or within an ag district. They just walk in and say it doesn't apply, these guys can do this. And, and, all, and like in the RRA district, which is basically encompasses all the, all the agricultural area, now regular farming is, is a standard permit. What we did put into the solar one, part of our criteria, when we do a special permit review for it, is whether or not they've considered not using prime farmland. And the state also emphasizes that in their permit process. So if somebody coming in wants to put in a 30 megawatt solar farm, they need to show that they've considered not using prime farmland wherever, wherever possible. So what, what we've done is we've sort of incorporated a lot of the state requirements just to make sure that we've emphasize that that and the reason we do that 
Because we didn't say anything about it. They can walk in and just run rush out over the town. So as long as we have it written into the law and have the standards in there, they have to at least take those into account before they can grant a permit. Chicken coop, two chickens in the backyard. And as far as raising livestock, you have to have a certain amount of area to be able to do that. And that would be in there, or that would be up to the uh, part, of, part of it's in here, part of it's in the law itself. That's part of the reason why we did the two hamlets. Because otherwise, you, could, you couldn't say, well, I can do it at my house, but you can't do it at your house. So by doing with the hamlets, you can exclude certain things from the hamlets. Whereas my house, I could do it. Yeah. yeah, one of the things we loosened up in the old law, you were restricted to no more than two accessory structures that make any difference. It no matter if you have 100 acres of land or two acres of land, you got to have a residence and then two accessory structures like a garage and a storage shed. Now we've expanded it that says for each lot size that you own over and above the minimum size, you can have one additional structure. So if you got five acres, you can basically have your residence and you can have five little sheds out there or a garage and four sheds or whatever. So it kind of loosens things up for people. Mickey was particularly upset about that because, well, we'll, we'll, we'll put a shed up there. We'll write it in there, so. And you still have the other restriction uh, one of the amendments that you put into the to the law, and it's actually part of the state code, is for structures that are less than 120 square feet, I think it was 12 by 12, 144 square feet, that the state says a building permit isn't required. We still require a zoning permit. The reason for that is because if you don't require a zoning permit, somebody can go out and just build a thing, put up a beautiful she shed, or have a nice playhouse for the kids, and the, the codes officer never hears about it to check it out to see if it's structurally sound and safe. And the assessor never hears about it to determine whether or not it adds to the value of the property. So by having the zoning permit requirement, even, even if Scott doesn't require a building permit, you're going to know about it. Is, is there any differentiation whether it's on a permanent foundation or, or it's a movable structure? No, we don't make any difference with that. Part of the idea was so that you couldn't put a she shed one inch from your neighbor's line. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't know about it, you build a foot from the, from, the, uh, from the edge of the lot and nobody ever know about it until it went up. So by doing the zoning permit, they have to follow the zoning law to keep it away from the border, on the border, or wherever. And, that, and, and then there, that includes two. Like when I lived in Woodsboro, you weren't allowed to have vehicles on your property unless they had licenses and registration. Yeah, we, we basically applied New York State junk, junkyard law, and there is also within there is a definition of what constitutes junk and what constitutes junk autos. And at what point you're considered as having a junkyard versus just having junk autos. But we, and basically they have to be operable under their own power even if they're not registered. So if you've got, you know, if you've got three cars in the backyard up on blocks, you're probably going to be in violation of this one. It's, you know, what is it for? Now the thing that's not in here that you guys pass as a separate law is the unsafe structures law. And that's more of a that's more of a building safety issue than it is a zoning issue. So if somebody somebody's got, you know, if we've got a house, you know, somewhere and it's kind of collapsing. Even if you're allowed to have a house on the property, if it's an unsafe structure, the codes officer can apply that law to it. Mm -hmm. and have we, just, it we just passed that. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah we, there, there's been a lot of questions about that enforcement. 
there are some unsafe structures. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there, there are some buildings that, uh, that Scott has tagged, put stickers on, yeah. on the properties and stuff. So there's questions about, well, now what happens? Well, if, if, you, if you go back into the law, there's, there's, a, there's a regular protocol in the law is that if he's given notice of it, he can go and inspect it. If he declares it to be unsafe, he can post it. What he's supposed to do is come back and notify you as the town board that I've identified an unsafe structure, I've identified the steps that need to be taken to bring it back into compliance so that it's safe, and then it's the town board's responsibility then to notify the property owner by letter that he, he or she has X number, I think it's 30 days, which can be extended, 30 days to show that they're making the corrections to it. If not, then the town board can actually take action to demolish the building and then build a project, put, put a lien on the property to cover the cost of doing that. So it, it gives you more power than you currently have right now, or you currently had before that. Prior to that, Scott could post a building and say, you can't live in it. That'd be it, the building could stay. Now you actually have the authority to have that building demolished if, they, if the owner doesn't do it or fix it up. I think there's a provision in there if the owner basically just doesn't even respond to the town board, then it can be given a court order. Yeah. Right? You can go to court. Yeah, you can, you can, get, a, you can get a court order to do it. Become criminal, right? Um, I would have to pull it up and look at it again. I think I think the way it's written right now, and we use the, the model law that we got from Tug Hill for it, I think if you, if you don't do it, it becomes a misdemeanor. Contempt of court, I think. Well, it, it could be that too if you have to obey, if they disobey the court order. So it has more teeth in it than we had before. If you follow. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's like any other law. You have to enforce it for, you know, for it to have any teeth, so. But it, it, what it does, it sets up due process. So, you know, it's like the hazards that identified the, noter, the owner is, is notified of the hazard, given an order to correct it so they have time to actually accomplish it. And then, and then if they don't, then you, you, you've given them due process and you can take whatever action is necessary. But that's totally separate from the zoning law itself, so. So being totally separate, what, what would you call it? What does that fall under? Uh, it's actually, it actually becomes a local law. Town law. It's enforceable by the codes officer and by the town board. Okay. So even, even if the property would comply under the zoning law, if it's unsafe, that second law applies. And Tug Hill advised us not to combine, that we were going to combine the two into one. They said, no, have a separate law for the unsafe structures. So that's, that's why we wrote that up for you. And the other one that we've started working on, I don't think we've actually presented it to you, there's also a nuisance properties law. We got the model from the Department of State on that. And that allows you to set certain standards within the individual zones within the town. So you could put a standard in place, let's say for Westernville and Northwestern, that says, you know, you can't have your grass any higher than four inches, you can't have noxious weeds, have to keep the trash out of the thing. You can, you can put that in there and that's an enforceable law. And then if you're worried about, well, you know, what about somebody up on Webster Hill? So don't enforce it in the RRA district or put much looser standards. You can apply those, you can apply different standards to each zone within the town once you've got those zones set up. So that way the, the laws can reference each other without actually being the same law. So it would be unsafe structure, we already got. Yep. This would be nuisance. Then you have nuisance properties. Nuisance yeah. properties. And, yeah, and you're working on that. Yeah. And that would be the same thing. It'll be a local law. It'd be another local law, same thing. Mm -hmm. Is that our spring project? <laughs> no, actually, he wants to start working on the comprehensive plan. Now. Well, that's planning. That doesn't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you don't care. That's not no. board. No. <laughs> Anything else? On the 
solar farms and that. I see you got a section on decommission them, but when they put them in, do they re are they required to bond to pay for that if they don't clean it up, or is there anything like yes. that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what's written into here. They have to they have to post the bond. Then the uh, town holds the bond. The town holds the bond, and the bond has to survive a change of ownership. So they can't sell it and say, well, we don't own it anymore, we, you know, we're not under the, no, bond goes with the solar farm itself. And I think we've given you the right every five years to make sure that it still covers the cost. And that's been pretty much upheld in most places. In fact, even, I think even the, even the larger ones, that uh, they have no problem with that, making sure that the cost of getting them out is covered. Solar farms in New York State right now. They're talking about the effectiveness. They're not working quite properly as they. A lot, of, a lot of areas they don't. A lot of areas they don't work well. Well, I mean, look how much sunshine we get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 But I, and in fact, I, I made a point of looking. I was trying to find out compared to the installed capacity versus how much power they've actually produced. And it works out that it becomes economically feasible at about 13 or 14 percent. Effectiveness, and there's a couple of them that are running around 12 and a half to 13, so they're right on the margin. Well, even the one like in front of Marcy, uh, the last three days, those have been all covered with snow, so yeah. they're probably zero percent that they're yeah. producing. Yeah, they're, they're probably down to you know, maybe five percent of capacity. Something. A little light gets through, but not much. Yeah. <coughs> Anything else? Mm -hmm. Dave, anything else? Nothing. Okay. No, it's, it's again a very, very impressive amount of work. Yeah, I and think you have a, a, I don't know if that's a copy of the map of the large, the large yeah. map, or is that the one that has all of the dimensional requirements on it? We basically kept most of what we had. Yeah. One of the things, the map, so. one of the comments from, I believe, the county, when they reviewed it, they they said something about um, being able to help with uh, mapping, like maybe matching. Yeah, in fact, I, I want to go talk to them. Tug Hill produced the one that's up on the wall. Uh -huh. They they used the uh, you know the, the New York State approved graphical information system for that. Um, I I think there may be better backgrounds you can put on the map or whatever. Uh, but that one contains. Uh, as, I think as close as they can they can get with the with the map updates, all of the tax parcels that are there. And that was one of the things that, that the county said they wanted to see on the map was the tax parcels. Because that way somebody with a parcel can identify what zone they they happen to lie in. And the, the two little inserts there are the same thing. Those actually came from the county, but they do show the tax parcels as well, so people can identify where they sit. We did address if somebody owns a property is in two different zones, how that gets handled. Yeah, but it could be a home of contention. If they if they if their property crosses the boundary between two different zones, there there's a there's actually a protocol that the that the courts have, have outlined. If if your residence lies primarily in the they, you apply the least restrictions based on the two zones. So if somebody's got a house that sits right across between an RC and the RRA zone, the RRA zone requirements would apply to that particular house. And and that follows, I'm trying to think of how the lawyers say it when we, when we do the training. Zoning law is considered, they're subrogatory laws, which means they're taking rights away from the people. And the state courts have always decided you cannot be more restrictive than is necessary. So one of the one of the things they teach you, if there's an ambiguity in the law, and we've tried to remove them all, you always decide in favor of the property owner, not in favor of the town. So you can't you can't be more restrictive than than the than the restrictions that are already applied. In other words, if they come in front of the ZBA, we cannot decide we want to be more restrictive 
than what the law says. That, that would get tossed out of court in about two seconds. Now this, I, I made another copy. These are the basically the dimensional requirements, the setbacks, and the, the road frontages and stuff. So you have a copy of that too. That would be one of the appendices for the, for the law. That probably did not change a great deal. Very little. Right. Very little. We added a few things in there because uh, the previous one, if you looked at the different zones, they would list this, 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 and this, and then say et cetera, which basically is like leaving the barn doors open and you know the cattle will wander out wherever they want. So pretty much if a use is defined, it's in that chart. And I've, I've cross-checked it at least you know, four or five times to make sure. In fact, the, the guy from the county found a couple that weren't on there, so we added them in. And most of them are pretty much the same as we already had. Yeah, there's a copy of that on the, on the website, too. So. Did you want to send it to Ironically, one of the things we ended up discussing for a couple of hours was sawmills. Mm -hmm. and what happens if somebody's got a portable sawmill? So, well, if they're bringing it in to cut wood for their, you know, cut lumber for their house, and it's just, a, it's just a, a tool, but if they're going to put it in there and actually sell lumber, now there's a set of requirements that covers that, what they have to have available. Things pop up like mushrooms sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the guy down the road from me brought his in when he was cutting lumber for his little place up there. So. Did we put in there where we have to review it every five years after it's approved? It, it'll be done in conjunction with the comprehensive plan review. So the planning board will redo the comprehensive plan, then they will look at the zoning law and decide whether or not changes are necessary. And if you work it the same way as we did this time, it's best if you would designate both the planning board and the zoning board as a joint committee to actually do the zoning law review. Because the ZBA usually ends up with the most experience in trying to handle stuff, which is, which is why they asked us to be part of the process in the first place. So take your time so we don't have to do it for a while. <laughs> we grind slow. <laughs> yeah, there, and there's probably a few things in there that may never ever apply in the town, given that we're probably never going to see any major housing developments or somebody come in and building roads so they can build houses. That's all in there, if they do. Anything more on that project over? Pretty much set. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a couple of that yesterday last night. Oh, the one over at Elmhill Road? No, yeah. I haven't heard of anything. So, uh, Nothing. Oh, they killed the townhouses? Yeah, they were going to go right, right on. Oh, they were going to go in right at our, they want to go our no, border no, there. No, we have the public city of Rome. Right. We went into that field that's back yeah. behind there. Yeah. Part of it, there was going to be one one apartment building in the main office. I think we should look at it and then. Yeah, they were going to have some like eight buildings, and seven of them were going to be in the town of Lee, and the other the other residents would be in ours plus the office. I think they had one that was in Rome too. Oh, it might have been. I'm not sure just where it crossed the line. It didn't on our side of it. Yeah. Because they're down that same company's building. What's that? Metal Merrick Road. Oh yeah, the, the that same townhouse that that's the same townhouse there group. Now. That's what they're looking for. We get, I haven't heard anything. I don't know if the town lead has. I haven't asked them. I know Scott has not heard anything from them. Carl, the last time that we had a working session, there was one or two items that um, I had questions about, and then we agreed to make adjustments. Did you? document those or do you want me to send you an email? So uh, send me an email and remind me. I know I wrote them down, but I'm not sure which piece of paper they're on. So okay. yeah. Just send me an email to get that to make sure we get that covered. You're all set, Dave? Yep. I just read those. Awesome. The, the other thing, we did, we did not decide we left it to the town board because that's you guys usually do it by resolution as to what the fee for a zoning permit is going to be. 
Yeah, we got uh, right now we charge 25 with 25 bucks if they come in for an appeal, but I don't know. But now you've got Scott's talking about all the different building permits, and then the zoning permit is separate from that. So you may want to just charge 25 for the initial permit, right? And now um, Larry did some research reaching out to other towns, and that that's going to be very helpful, yeah, about their scale. Um, and then we have Scott's proposal, so yeah, we'll mull that over. Yeah, that, that's up to you guys to set the fees on. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. A motion to adjourn? Or do I have to call it back in? No, we're we're just in the meeting. Yeah. yeah. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Then? I'll make that motion. Second. Okay. Are you, you going to want to meet again for any discussions? Or I think we're going to. We're going to. We're going to review it each individually and then make sure we, we're not, at this point, I don't think so, but. Well, I but again, the zoning board would meet next Monday if you, if right. you want to have a working session then. We don't have much business to accomplish, so. Okay. If you want to do that next week, just you know, put it on the calendar. You know. The kind of the plan by the end is that we're going to review it at the next board meeting. We'll see if we need another working session or then at that time we may say we'll make a motion to adjourn. Yeah. 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 I think he uses Delta Glen Maple that he mailed up. Yeah, I've got some something things. like that. But he also uses Claudia's email too, so either one will get to him. Yeah, it's on the it's on the kid yeah, you know, if you look at the, the calendar on the website, I mean as far as the zoning board, I leave it intact that every fourth Monday we're gonna meet. Unless you hear from the other ones. I mean, if, you know, if there's no reason to call anybody out of snow, we're not going to do it. But. And they, they typically meet third? The planning board meets on the third Monday, the zoning board meets on the fourth. So if you guys are on the second, third, and fourth sets. And I, Larry's got that all on the calendar. Since you are trained, did you want to start doing the planning and zoning board calendar? Yeah, I can, I can go ahead and do and then the minutes too. Yeah. If you need them. Once you try it, if you need any yeah, questions. Yeah, if there's any changes, I, I have access to the website and I can edit it now, so. Okay. Yeah, sure. If you need any help with that. Yeah. But as you know, it's pretty straight. Well, plus eventually what I want to start doing is is kind of putting like, you know, the frequently asked questions and stuff because, you know, I, I've got a whole set of these publications, like, just the part of the state publishes these things. And it's got quotes from the, the actual state laws and everything else and the recommendations. So if people have questions, they'll know where to go initially with the police. I want to check with Scott again. I checked with him last year, but I want to see if, he, if there's any applications, yeah. like building in front of the zone. No. Yeah, he may, he may want to change it, or I know he was working on the, you know, the app, but for a zoning one, you would want to have a separate zoning permit sheet. Yeah, so you could pull the application off the, off off the website. website. Yeah, the before, you, before you meet with him. Yeah, it, uh, it's possible. It's possible to set them up as one of these fillable PDFs, right. so you can download it, fill it out, and then just email it back to him.
garage mm -hmm. with these garage band friends. <laughs> yeah. They crank it until it's feedback. Yes. <laughs> and back it off a little bit. <laughs> so is there any news on the new town hall? Or not really? Not really, no. No, no new plans, no. no I, was, I was gonna ask to see when, when the committee's gonna meet again, I'm not sure, so. Yeah. All one level, no two story. Uh, I, let's put it this way, I have thoughts about the new town hall. And once we have the meeting, I, I will I will feel free to express them. So, because when we when I went to Saratoga, they left one entry through the old building and the new building, so then they had to do the historical touches. Yeah. Well, the, the plan that they got from the architectural firm incorporated this building and then the new one in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, the new one in the back was I think was was two story, and there was a two story like almost like a a walkway in between the two things. But it's a really really expensive way to go. Because there's a lot of work that has to be done in this building if you're going to continue to use it for public access, especially the stairs and that one, and come up to this one. They, what they were talking about is, is in the little section that couples the two buildings, they would have all those little people mover things that you know runs at about a furlong per fortnight to get you from one floor to the other. Mm -hmm. oh, thank thank you. You. Um, and if uh, if you've ever ridden one of those things, and you were going to have a meeting upstairs, and there were 35 people who wanted to get upstairs with it. You'd have to start a half an hour ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm not convinced that that's a, that's a smart way to do it. I, I think the smarter, in my, in my, my opinion, the smarter thing, new building over there. Restore this one as a historical structure. Keep it that way. Yes. It's much cheaper. Make everything one level. Single single floor, 5,000. I have, I have, <laughs> Conceptual plans that I radiant floor, floor, radiant floor heat, <laughs> radiant, well, radiant floor heat, geothermal heating. Mm -hmm. Why are they going to run the lines for geothermal? Or can you run it right down the you, you just go out there and dig down about six feet and lay the pipes in there. You're going to get all the all the heat you need out of that. I've got them. And you don't. <laughs> I, a friend of mine's got a system. We've got to have force out of there. Yeah. Well, you can you can you can do a you can do a heat pump and water exchange too. The newer ones, right? But if you do a heat more heating, then you lose the benefit of the, uh, the summertime cool. Yeah, you got to have four So, just a silly question: but Why haven't we written the grants to restore these buildings into this national historic landmark? I I don't know. Uh, we had talked about that. And I had looked. Think? I had looked up on some of the websites to find out you know, what kind of grants are available, uh, and they're out there. Each each year they open up some money that's available for it. But you have to have a pretty you have to have a pretty good plan already in place to what you want to do with it. So there was consideration with incorporating this with an additional structure, with a separate building, and then and then you know, restore this one as you know as the historic structure. So you know. Before you're going to apply for it, you have to make up your mind what you want to do. What if they call it? What do if they don't restore it? If they don't restore it, it's going to go to hell. Right, and it's, that's what I'm, I'll question. Yeah, well, that's not a so, Yeah, yeah, what, what needs, there needs to be, there needs to be work done upstairs. Yeah. Uh, for repairs and some insulation and stuff. And then you can go inside the room. It has to be re 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you could re you, know, you could re-insulate it. I mean they did some of that work here with this that you know, has additional insulation yeah. on it. And you maintain the architectural integrity of it yeah. by, by doing that. And there and there's you know, I don't know what the size of the grants are. the ones I was looking at were fifty or hundred thousand dollars. Doesn't get a lot done, but if you do that two years in a row, if you do it two years, yeah. If you do it two years in a row, we we'll get the same money for a couple of years in orbit. If you can find one that'll give you three or four hundred thousand dollars, that's enough to put the decision in the yeah, I mean you yeah. can you can have stuff, you know, and, and, and rock and things like that. Yeah, I mean that might be something they consider, but you know the, oh, the board's okay. gonna have to decide that's what they want to do with it. Uh, yes. But what's the thought of putting the library in the town hall as one? One level, one building, heat one building, then we have two buildings that would be surplus. Yeah. Um, because you would, it would be two different entities, you don't have to deal with two buildings, you don't have to deal with. You put everything that's one, everything that's one level, then you don't have to deal with the. Yeah, you, you can do that, but in order to incorporate the library, you'd have to go up to something almost like 10,000 square feet. 
mm. in order to get everything in there. Uh, and that dramatically increases the cost, where if you leave the library as is and then put in your new town hall. And like I said, there I have you know there they were just you know my, my little CAD program stuff that I that I gave the committee to look at when we were doing it before. Um, I've still got them. So. And besides, if we built a new town hall and combine the library with it, then we're going to have two buildings that are going to be empty. And what are we going to do? Two empty buildings. Then they still have to be have still maintained. have to maintain maintained because they're both historical. Yeah. So if you're going to maintain it, you might just as well use it. Yeah. Uh, and this this one. Uh, in, in my view, if you if you restore this back, I know you can take out these offices because you right. won't need them anymore. But you can turn this thing into a museum. There's a lot of historical stuff around the town you can bring in here and, and have it as a place where people can come in. Uh, I, I mean, you can even you can still rent this room out if somebody wanted to come in and have a little meeting or a party, or whatever. It's available. The biggest thing the biggest thing is to worry about. Uh, well, the, the biggest problem with upstairs is there's no handicap access. Well, like I said, you can get a stair chair. You can get a stair chair. That will go up that because it's not a hard turn to make on there. It, it, it ain't cheap. But if you have a new town hall <laughs> and you move the town justice out, you can put a elevator right in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a big one, just enough to run three or four people off at a time. You could probably put an elevator so, right where the you stairs are. Do anything with the yeah. nickels there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's ways to do it. Oh, there's a set of stairs. Help them now. There's a small stairway in the yeah, back that goes up behind the stairs. Yeah, it goes up behind the stairs. Yeah, it goes up behind but a little bit grand. But we're talking about millions of dollars. We're not talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars now. They weren't half. Well, they weren't. Yeah, I mean, the elevator, the elevator <laughs> itself would probably be about $50,000 or $60,000. Oh, yeah, four gallons. And then yeah. another you know, $200,000 to rent. That's why I was saying the stair chair is probably more feasible yeah. because. Put yeah, except there. it just can't handle it. Really Although, if you, go, if you go into the Delta Lake Hill, that's what yeah. they used to get up to the second floor. They have stair chairs. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, towards the end of the week, yeah. You know. Actually, it's supposed yeah. to be close to oh, well, yeah. If you got yeah. five yeah. people that need to use the stairs, you're not. When, when, when we sit behind, we week. sit behind the table when we're voting. You see how many people on the town would actually have to use the stairs. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But even with the, what I think of every building, now, that building would have to come down too, right? What? The one over here. That house, I think it's. Condemned. But they're already planning. They're starting. I think I don't know if they've condemned it, but they're already planning on tearing it down. The biggest issue right now is they've got to do an asbestos removal on it. Uh, oh, it's got some asbestos. Yeah, I think there's. Yeah, I think there's some with the heating system in there. At least I, I, I haven't been through the thing myself. That but Phil Spore said, yeah, you got to do asbestos. So. And that's the same thing with the green building behind too. That's got problems. The green building. We got a little house over there, off the back of this property. Oh, I, I don't know. With that one. But that's they haven't bought that or nothing. No, they they did not they didn't buy that one. We just go to the back end of the park. Oh, and I think there's over there's, there's there's like four and three quarter acres over there. Goes yeah. back to the river. Goes down to the river, yeah. Right, back up to the river, yeah. And the nice thing over there, I mean you put town hall in, you can you can expand, have it have a new park over there. Uh, you know, whatever you want to do with it and, and uh, there's a lot of room for stuff like that there. Whether they will or not. I mean we've got a park now, we've got Nobody's using it. Yeah, and you got you got the pickleball courts and stuff. Well, down here the river, no one takes care of that anymore either. Yeah, yeah. it's dirty. It's yeah. people hanging out down there. I swear, I think they're doing drugs down there. I, I, I'm finding needles up on Gifford Hill.